Welcome everybody. We're just waiting for a few minutes to allow everybody to join the link before we start. Welcome everybody, we're just waiting for a few minutes to allow people to join the link before we start. Welcome everybody. We are just waiting for a few minutes to allow everybody to join the link before we start. Shall we uh, kick off now? Thanks ever so much for everyone for coming to join Five Stone Building's first uh, careers webinar. My name's Ruth Hughes. I'm a junior barrister at Five Stone Buildings and I was called in 2007. I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that Chambers does and some of the interesting work that I do and why I really enjoy it. We're then going to talk uh, hear from Eliza Eagling. She was called in 2015. She's one of the more junior barristers in Chambers, but she's uh, building a successful career. And she's going to tell you about what life is like uh, at the more junior end of Chambers and how to build that practice and how she does it. We're going to then hear from Sarah Huron. Uh, she's on the pupillage. Uh, committee at Five Stone Buildings and indeed she interviewed me for my pupillage I believe in the room that Arabella is currently sitting in. Arabella Adams is going to be our final um, uh, participant uh, this evening. She is Chambers newest recruit. She was started in practice following the successful completion of her pupillage at Five Stone Buildings in October of this year and she's going to talk to you about what it's like to be a pupil in Chambers. Um, obviously we can't have mini pupils in Chambers at the moment because of Covid. That's a real shame because mini pupillage is a really valuable experience for uh, aspiring barristers because it's a really excellent way of finding out whether areas of practice might be for you. I certainly didn't join law school thinking that what I wanted to be was a chancery barrister but I'm really glad that it's where I've ended up. We're hoping that this webinar can 
uh, give you an introduction to what life at the traditional chancery bar is and why uh, we like to practice uh, at Five Stone Buildings and how you might go about applying uh, to join us as well. It might be a reasonable question to ask, what do I mean by traditional chancery? And I should also say that there is a Q&A box uh, where you can feel free to post your questions and we will do uh, a question and answer session at the end. We are recording the webinar so that other aspiring barristers can watch it in the future. So if you want to remain anonymous, you can uh, click the anonymous button when your uh, question is um, typed in so that you don't get recorded if you don't want to be. Uh, so I was asking myself the very good question, what is traditional chancery? Uh, what does it even mean? Oh, that's a reasonable question to ask. Traditional chancery work relates to the work that was traditionally done in the Court of Chancery before the Judicature Acts in the 19th century. Really, what we mean by traditional chancery is private client litigation, trusts, and allied questions that relate to property law. What we do tends to involve the estates of dead people, the uh, issues arising from trusts, which you might have studied in equity. We also do a great deal of court of protection work, which is work in court the court that protects people who lack mental capacity to make decisions for themselves. That is primarily property and affairs work, so to do with property, but some of our barristers also do uh, welfare uh, work, um, although not everybody does that by a long chalk. We also have a thriving tax practice in Chambers, which involves uh, not only advising on the implementation of um, tax arrangements to do with inheritance tax and capital gains tax, so personal wealth taxation to do with passing uh, in, um, property on to future generations, but also we have some practitioners who specialise in contentious uh, tax and make arguments in the tribunals um, both for and against uh, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. There are people in chambers who also have niche practices uh, that deal with pensions, which is a, um, a kind of cross between trust law and employment law, and also some people who do uh, specialist uh, real property, although most people in chambers will be able to do some uh, real property, particularly where it crosses over with the other aspects of private client law that we regularly deal with, for example, proprietary estoppel, undue influence, joint tenancies, that kind of thing stack and Dowden claims. So that's the broad overview of what practice chambers generally has. That means mostly, not exclusively, working for private clients. It's, I think, great to work for private clients because uh, they are, your work always makes a real difference to their lives. With that, um, comes a great deal of responsibility because the amounts that are uh, at stake are often um, those um, sufficient to impact on where the clients are living and losing a case can have really disastrous consequences. But your work really matters to your clients and that isn't always the case if you're doing commercial law, working for large institutions, um, doing their commercial disputes. So that's one of the, I think, really attractive aspects of uh, private client litigation which we routinely uh, deal with. Um, I was going to talk to you a little bit about the colour that can come from doing the kind of work that I routinely do and I thought that I would talk to you about three or four cases that come within those broad headings of uh, contentious trusts and um, estates, court of protection and tax. So I would say often when I'm asked what I do, I do dead people and mad people and tax. But I'm going to not talk about a, an estate that a state issue. I'm going to talk about a case that I did that involved trusts um, that are, I think you might be interested in. So I, um, I tend to say that I represented 22 highly endangered Chinese tigers in a divorce. Now that might have you 
make coming up with some questions. I mean, how did you represent tigers, Ruth, you might say? Well, I'm on the Attorney General's B panel um, and the Attorney General, as you might know, if you've done charity in your trust law course, is able to represent all charitable interests. So I was uh, representing the Attorney General in the Court of Appeal. What had happened before was there was a husband and a wife, um, not surprisingly, because it was a divorce. Uh, and their, um, their family breakdown was unusual because they had a structure that they had set up in Mauritius that owned a very large amount of South African land in the Orange Free State. Um, the default beneficiary of which was an English charity, which benefited these 22 Chinese tigers. Now the Chinese tigers had not it hadn't gone well for them in general as a species, uh, the Cultural Revolution, because um, the way in which China developed uh, made uh, their continued existence in China very difficult. So before, my, uh, before the trust that I was involved with was set up, there were no Chinese tigers in the wild and only about 150 um, that were in zoos. And the wife in my case, who was Chinese, was very passionate about the saving of the Chinese tiger. And uh, she uh, engaged her husband, who was a, a successful banker, to uh, fundraise and put his own money into this trust for the tigers. She persuaded the People's Republic of China to send some of the tigers to be rewilded in the uh, Orange Free State. And that was very successful. They bred very well because the tigers liked their new um, diet of springbok. Um, and um, it went very well. It was, I always thought, amusing that they were called one of the tigers, Tiger Woods. Um, and they came to a point where the marriage really was put under a great deal of pressure by the tiger charity. And the wife fell out with the husband about how the tigers were portrayed on social media. This is literally true. Uh, and she was divorcing the husband and as part of the relief she was asking for, uh, she was asking for a finding that the tiger settlement was a nuptial settlement and could be varied by the matrimonial court. So when this came to the Court of Appeal, the Attorney General wanted to be involved so that uh, he at the time could uh, ensure that the tigers were properly represented and their charitable interest was properly represented. And I, uh, I took a neutral stance, but broadly uh, ensuring that the trust's interests were uh, properly considered before the court. And the court decided that the settlement was not a nuptial settlement and couldn't be uh, divided up in the uh, divorce claim. So the, the, the tiger's land was not available for the wife. Uh, to get provision for her. So I thought that was a really exciting and interesting case and really not the sort of thing that I would uh, generally have expected that I would be doing uh, at the bar. And that's my first uh, exciting, interesting case. I've got another one. And this one also involved Eliza actually, so I hope she wasn't planning to talk about it. Uh, we both acted um, last year in a case about a person who was an aristocrat who lacked mental capacity uh, to make a will. He had made provision for his two children uh, to give his estate, which included a, a castle in Scotland to his children on trust. As his capacity declined, he made a decision to marry his carer. Um, the capacity uh, to marry is a very low threshold and um, certainly there was a good uh, chance that he had capacity to marry her when they married. They were living together, uh, she was caring for him. The nature of the relationship was a bit odd, but he said that he loved her. Um, Eliza was a junior barrister for someone else in, uh, in a different chambers who was representing the son uh, of the aristocrat. I was representing the official solicitor who was acting for him as his litigation friend because he lacked mental capacity. In the end, we did a deal uh, whereby um, the estate was structured so that the spouse relief, the tax spouse relief that's available uh, to a UK domiciled spouse, as she said she was, uh, could be used to save um, the bulk, almost all of the inheritance tax on the estate uh, so that um, a solution that was 
monetarily better for the children uh, was achieved. I was disappointed that that case settled, although it was very much in the best interests of my client that it did, because uh, if we hadn't settled, the court would have um, engaged in some really interesting uh, issues about the test for capacity to marry and whether or not you have to be able to understand, um, whereas uh, Liza's client was arguing, that uh, a marriage revokes your will. It does in England anyway, we found out that it doesn't in Scotland, which was an interesting uh, learning point for us. Um, because I was going to argue that part of the relevant information for a decision to marry isn't whether or not uh, your will is revoked. I was going to say, no one ever said, oh, I was going to marry Rebecca, but I found out that it revokes my will, so I've decided not to. That is a completely irrational thought process because everybody can just put in place a new will, and so can people who lack mental capacity, although the Court of Protection has to authorise it in their best interests. So I also thought that that was uh, a really interesting case. It had very... Um, uh, interesting facts uh, and a uh, bit of salacious detail and also some very interesting points of law and that's typical of the cases that I uh, enjoy doing. I've, I haven't talked about my tax cases and I am going to briefly talk about a couple of the cases that I'm doing that are very different that are contentious tax. Both of them are for Her Majesty's uh, Revenue and Customs Historically, I've been involved in a, a rather long running um, and um, large case called Ingenious. You might have heard of it because some of the um, people involved in the scheme are very well known. For example, uh, David Beckham invested in it, Bobby Williams invested in it. That's all in the public domain. Uh, they invested um, in films like Avatar, A Life of Pi, Girl with a Pearl Earring, and they were doing so in order to avoid tax. Um, there was about a billion pounds at stake for HMG. Uh, and I was involved in a very large nine person council team uh, that set about uh, showing that the scheme didn't work and the tax was due. Um, I got to cross examine a expert on film, uh, independent film production in the UK, which was very interesting, although it was a bit embarrassing because I went to the Arsenal where I have uh, a, a season ticket that, on the evening and I found out that I was sitting two people down from the person I had just cross-examined and I was quite disappointed when he didn't seem that intimidated when I uh, turned up. Mm -hmm. I also got to examine um, one of the um, uh, executives at Ingenious all about the closing of the contracts on Avatar and his relationship uh, and the email correspondence with one of the leading executives at Pathé. So that was very interesting and I learned a huge amount from uh, the other silks that were involved in that case. There were many silks involved. Um, but I got lots of opportunity to um, practice my advocacy um, in a difficult setting and I, although it was hugely hard work, uh, enjoyed that too. I want to co uh, contrast that with some other uh, tax work that I'm doing at the moment where I'm the sole counsel for uh, HMRC in relation to the capital gains tax on an old master. We do have a and a small art practice in chambers. Many people often say they want to do art law, and I should say that only some people are able to do um, art law. It's very specialised. Arabella got to do a little bit when she was uh, a pupil, um, but it's not the main thing we do, but we do do some, and we are a leading chambers for art law. And that's looking at whether or not a uh, taxpayer can avoid millions of pounds worth of CGT by claiming that his uh, painting was plant in a gallery business. So uh, I've been working with HMRC accountants and the policy team uh, at um, capital gains tax uh, to get all of our um, arguments uh, together for our statement of case. And um, this is quite interesting because of the subject matter. So um, I hope you can understand why I enjoy the practice that I've got. Um, I did want to say 
that I understand that pupillage application is really competitive. And I wanted to reiterate that if you get some rejections along the way, um, you've got to take that on the chin. I myself did 22, 21 or 22 pupillage applications. I got five first round interviews, three second round interviews and only one pupillage, but you can only do one, one's all you need. Um, and I really regard it as the luck of my life that I managed to get uh, pupillage at Five Stone Buildings and I'm really happy to be here. So I'm gonna hand over now to Eliza, who's going to talk to you a little bit about what it's like to be uh, a more junior tenant uh, in Chambers. Thanks, Eliza. Thanks very much, Ruth. Um, yes, I did very much enjoy that case that we did. Um, and I was just thinking that we also had arguments about the marriage because it wasn't consummated, but perhaps that's a talk for, a, for another day. But um, it was, yeah, fascinating case. Um, so I did my pupillage at Five Stone Buildings, and I'm not going to um, crash too much into Arabella's talk, but um, both Sarah and Ruth here were my pupil mistresses, um, and I enjoyed pupillage, although it is, um, I guess it is quite a tough experience, but glad to get through it, and um, at Five Stone Buildings we do a one-year pupillage, so I had a year to um, get ready, I suppose. And then it is, um, I think it is maybe quite intimidating the first time, you know, when you suddenly, the, you know, the uh, you wake up and you think, gosh, it's the 1st of October and now I'm a tenant um, and I have all this responsibility. Although um, there are a few um, saving points perhaps. I mean, one thing is, I mean, perhaps every chamber says, it, says this, but we really do have an open door policy in chambers. I'm obviously not literally so much at the moment because many of us are working from home, although I can see Arabella is in the office. Um, but for example, in normal times, um, many people's doors are actually open, literally, you can go in, you can talk to them, you see them in the corridor. Arabella, Ruth and I are all, in, are all in the basement and we spent, for some reason, we spend quite a lot of time sitting on the floor drinking tea, um, which surprises clients when they come downstairs to use the client lose and they think, <laughs> um, it's a bit of a, because they've, upstairs they're with the barrister with the suit on and then downstairs we're just in our leggings, um, you know, talking about law or, uh, or other things. Um, at the moment, we have a juniors WhatsApp uh, group, which is both entertaining and useful. Um, we have, in normal times, we have real chambers tea um, with actual tea, or you can bring your own coffee if you like. Um, at the moment, we have, well, we have virtual tea, don't we? I think, yeah, we have virtual Zoom tea, although I think everybody in the world has got Zoom fatigue. Um, so uh, we're actually trying to think of ways to make Zoom more exciting. So if you have any message, any, any tips for us, let us know. Um, but I've always, I've always found it to be really friendly and, you know, I regularly phone up Sarah and Ruth at the moment, for example, to ask them questions and everybody always has time for you. And I think that makes all the difference in the world. Um, so not long after I'd started, I actually went off on secondment to Withers, uh, uh, their, well, their contentious trust team, um, and it was sort of maternity leave cover, and that was incredibly useful and I think we've now really got into a swing of um, sending people off um, in again I say in usual times either on secondment or for example some people have gone off to the Supreme Court for a year and I, I found it really helpful going on secondment because I think you just don't quite understand the pressures that solicitors are under and in, and the ways in which their working lives are the same and the ways in which they're different and I think if you can go and spend a few months there uh, with a law firm, um, then I think you're in a better position to be as helpful to your instructing solicitors as possible because perhaps you have a better sense of, of what's going on. And you can also build up um, working relationships. So I'm still instructed by Withers um, and that's been very helpful. I know other people have gone on secondments, you know, they've built up relationships with those solicitors that they worked with. Um, so that I think is a useful thing to do. Um, now Ruth's already talked about that generally speaking the types of work we do, so I'll just say what it might be like as a junior tenant. We do quite a number of cases and um, in respect to the Inheritance Provision for Family Independence Act 1975, bit of a mouthful, we tend to call it the 1975 Act. Um, if you're a junior tenant you'll probably either um, be involved in relatively small estates or for example, you might do lead work. So last year, I was involved in the case of Cowan and Foreman, um, Penny Reed and Chambers um, QC was leading me and that went to the Court of Appeal. 
Um, so uh, that, that's something you might do. Um, also on my list, I've got, we do quite a lot of estate administration work and bed, bread and butter for junior tenants is PR and trustee removals getting those people who have um, gone a bit mad, gone a bit AWOL, you know, threatening um, to sell trust assets and, you know, run off with the proceeds, anything like that. And um, we do that. Caveat removal might not be a word you recognize, but it's to do with the getting of grants um, in a deceased person's estate. We also do, as a junior tenant, uh, particularly in the first year, private client work, so sort of some tax advice, um, CGT, IHT, trust, basic trust drafting, like um, trustee appointments. Um, Reese already mentioned the court of protection. Um, again, bread and butter work for junior tenants, statutory wills. Um, Ruth and I were actually in a statutory settlement case. Um, and that's because, because we, um, the person in question was under 18 so you couldn't have a will so we were going for a trust instead um trying to think what other cop work I suddenly come blank on the cop work um oh yes I do a lot of work for the OPG and um some now work for the OS so for the OPG um their remit is um look supervising attorneys and deputies so I've gone all over the courts of um, England and also Wales um once bad public transport in Wales I can tell you <laughs> amaze me how, why they make it so difficult to get to a court um but um yeah uh, so we get to learn an awful lot about um people who have stolen money from people who lack capacity which is not always that jolly but there we go and also common intention constructive trust I've done quite a lot of advice um drafting in relation to that um Again, it's probably a talk for another day, but it's basically where you have, say, cohabitants. You probably, I don't know where you've got to. Some of you might be uh, just starting your law conversion, but cohabitants, say, who co-own a property and um, how it's owned and how the sale proceeds are divided. Um, Re suggested that I talk a little bit about the balance between um, being in court and not being in court. Um, I checked my diary and I think I've got one hearing a week um, at the moment and have done for a while so but I mean it's um that would just be a hearing of one or two hours say um and now and then trials although a lot of our work settles um and then the rest of the time I will be doing drafting um so that might be drafting correspondence or drafting pleadings writing opinions um mediations we quite a lot of our work goes to mediation and uh so I've been doing zoom mediations which have actually gained surprisingly well i thought that they uh don't know what anyone else thinks but i thought that they might not work as well and so far in so some of mine have gone actually better than i would have thought perhaps because people are in the comfort of their own homes um i just talk a little bit of, i'm trying to think of a couple of cases that i found really interesting i was um well reese obviously taken my scottish castle case away from me <laughs> <laughs> Scottish castle and sex I mean how, you couldn't get better than that um I had a court of protection matter which was actually more perhaps um health and welfare but I acted for a property and affairs deputy who's a solicitor and that is uh the difference between a deputy and an attorney which is probably a word you have heard of is a deputy is a uh, court appointed and the deputy phoned me up and he said well we have this lady who's um lived in uh she lives in Cardiff and she's basically watched Netflix or equivalent for her whole life and just had a quiet life. And then somebody contacted her on her own Facebook and said, would you like to come to Montecito Bay and Jamaica, um, in, to come to Jamaica? Um, and she said, great idea. Uh, that's exactly what I'd do. So she went on a plane to Jamaica and turns out this was in the middle of hurricane season. That there was Zika virus. She didn't have any of her medication on her. Um, she was in a hut and then she phoned us up well phoned the deputy up and said oh and the person who invited her out has just been murdered and we had no idea if that was a ploy for money um actually transpires he was in fact murdered because as far as we understand his mate was jealous that he'd got this woman from cardiff out there and wanted you know so there we go and i was asked how do we get her back um in circumstances where there was a state of emergency at that time uh, in Jamaica, so it wasn't straightforward. So that was um, that was one of my exciting cases. 
Um, it was the last year I did a case led by Henry Legg QC in Chambers, which was to do with the Human Rights Act, which you might think has no business in trust, which, you know, I think many people still think that, um, but it was to do with the rights of illegitimate and adopted children, because as a matter of English law, both common law and statute, um, because of the interaction between the statute and the trust in question, adopted and illegitimate children were out. Interestingly, it was only the issue, the, um, the trust deed um, stated that the beneficiaries were male descendants of the settler's siblings. Um, and I, we had to compose these letters to the women in the family tree because we were trying to find illegitimate children. And I did get some really rather outraged. It was an all male team apart from me. So obviously I had the role of trying to write to these women um, and I couldn't find a particularly good way of doing it. And we did get some outraged letters back saying, why in 2019 are you asking me if I have illegitimate children and why do you only care about the boys? Um, to which there was no particularly good answer. Um, and I learned lots of um, practical things. I mean, it turns out that it's very difficult to um, trace to use genealogical research to find illegitimate children because um, you need to name both the parents' names, but obviously you might not. So if you don't know that they already exist, difficult to find that they do then exist, which is why we were writing to the women. Um, so that was interesting because I actually studied human rights law in my master's. Um, so it's nice to bring that back. I studied French before then and I don't, don't get to use much French. Um, what else have I got on my list? Ah, yes. Practice not killed off by COVID. Yeah, as Rhys said, dead people, mad people and tax, none of which are going away um, at this time. So um, we're, in fact, I think we were quite busy. It has been quite an up and down year. I've had some quiet patches, but now uh, just in time for the seminar, it's got absolutely hectic again. Um, but I mean, like, I, you know, I sort of reiterate what Rhys says. I'm very, very, very happy to be in five steam buildings. I consider some of my closest friends to be in chambers. Um, I, you know, very grateful to my people, supervisors, just doing such a good job. And um, I think the work is absolutely fascinating. And I feel very lucky to have a job that um, I love and keeps me constantly entertained or mostly entertained. <laughs> Thanks very much, Eliza. Uh, I'll give you that five pounds later. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to pick up a few things from uh, what Eliza said. I mean, firstly, it was great that Eliza managed to uh, talk about a case which is literally the punchline to Jamaica. No, she went of her own accord. Um, uh, she mentioned some acronyms that I thought I'd translate for you in case uh, you're not aware what they mean. She talked about the OPG, that's the Office of the Public Guardian, who protects um, people who lack capacity where they have attorneys uh, acting and investigates them if they've been doing a bad job, uh, which they often do do, um, financial abuse can be quite rife for people that lack capacity. She mentioned the OS, that's the official solicitor, where someone lacks capacity to litigate, the official solicitor is the uh, litigation friend of last resort, and people in chambers frequently act for the official solicitor, primarily in court protection cases. She and I'm just gonna jump in there and say, mm -hmm. to explain to everyone that this is what happens all the time, you know, Ruth and I in the pub, you know, I might start talking, Ruth, my translator. <laughs> 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 um, she mentioned CGT and IHT, that's capital gains tax and inheritance tax, they're capital taxes that frequently arise in our practice. And she also mentioned the Supreme Court, and I thought I would also say that um, chamber, members of chambers are frequently involved in Supreme Court matters uh, in the areas we practice in. Penelope Reid uh, was and Hugh Cumber were in Islet and Mitson and uh, Hugh Cumber and David Rees were in Staveley, which is an inheritance tax case. Hugh went on secondment, uh, as Eliza mentioned, to the Supreme Court, and he's uh, been able to build his appellate practice uh, in a, uh, according, accordingly, which has been great for him. I'm now going to, oh. and, oh, sorry. Please, I was just gonna jump in and say, we've got a few questions. I don't know if I yeah. should- I thought I'd do the questions at the end, if that's okay, sure. Eliza. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, there's one that might be suitable for Arabella, so she can review that. <laughs> at the same time. Thanks so much, Eliza. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Sarah, who's going to tell uh, you about the pupillage application process at Five Stone Buildings. Thanks, Sarah. Great. Thank you, Ruth. And um, uh, I hear you're, you've promised Eliza five pounds. I, I promised her ten, so we'll have to have a discussion about that later. <laughs> um, <laughs> as Ruth mentioned, I'm on the pupillage committee in uh, Chambers, and I have been for some time. Um, 
I just wanted to give you a brief overview this evening really about four things. Uh, first of all, how to go about applying for pupillage at five stone buildings. Secondly, what the timetable is for applying. Thirdly, what are the qualities we're looking for um, when we're looking to recruit uh, for pupillage and also for tenancy? And fourthly, well, what's the process once you've put in your application? What's the sort of um, process between making that application and finding out whether an offer is going to be made? Um, so looking at how you apply for pupillage at Five Stone Buildings, um, Chambers is a member of Pupillage Gateway which is a centralised um, application process administered by the Borough Council. And we've been a member now, this is our second year of, of membership, and we think it gives um, you as applicants really the easiest way in because um, you can apply to up to 20 uh, chambers through Gateway and as many chambers as you want who aren't part of Gateway, but it gives you a sort of centralised um, application form. Um, Chambers offers up to two pupillages per year. We normally offer at least, um, make one offer at least um, per year. And the pupillage award is £60,000, of which £15,000 can be drawn down in the pre-pupillage year. Um, so the way that the application form works with pupillage gateway is that there are some details on it which are common to e all applications if you like so for example your exam results um, will be the same for every every application that you make um, but each chambers gets to ask some specific questions relevant to your application um, on the, on the gateway form so to give a very simple example will ask you why are you applying to five stone buildings and only the chambers that have asked that question will get to see your uh, your answers on that so i would say a key bit of advice when you come to complete your application form is don't just copy and paste your answers even if the question is quite similar from a different set of chambers make sure that you're answering um, the particular questions that that you're being asked by this set of chambers by, by five stone buildings in our case and that your answers are relevant to um, that, that question. So that's the sort of the, the process. I, sh I should say that from the 27th of November, so later this month, you'll be able to see on the Gateway um, website, a practice application form, and also the specific questions that Five Stone Buildings is going to ask uh, in this pupillage application year. So check out the pupillage gateway app uh, website later this um, month because that will enable you now to start assembling information relevant to your application so you're ready to submit it when the window um, opens and even if you're not applying for pupillage this year I think it's a really good idea to to check out the gateway website and to look at that practice application form now so that you have an idea um, what a pupillage application form looks like and what details you'll need to provide when you come to apply. Um, the actual application windows, the time within which you can submit your, your application for pupillage um, at Five Stone Buildings through Gateway, it opens on the 4th of January next year, 2021, and closes on the 8th of February, um, 2021. So you've got a month within which to submit your application once it, once it opens. It doesn't matter when in that period you put your application in, so there's no premium on early submission because we only get to see your applications when the window closes. Um, so we get, I think, the applications on the 11th of February or somewhere around that date. And then between the 11th of February and the 6th of May is the period within which Chambers can and will conduct its sort of recruitment process. And I'll, I'll come on in a bit more detail to talk about that. But typically, um, we do two rounds of interviews uh, probably in March or uh, and April, um, all slightly COVID dependent, the, the timetable this year, but um, that, that is what I envisage um, happening. And then because we're part of Gateway, I think, I think now all chambers actually, whether in Gateway or not, have got to adhere to this um, timetable. Offers are made by the 7th, on the 7th, in fact, on the 7th of May, and you will have seven days if you've received an offer to accept it or not. So that's the timetable. Um, 
the next thing I wanted to talk about a bit was, well, what are we looking for? I mean, what, what, what are the qualities that we're looking for from um, an applicant? Um, and we've got some very clear criteria which we apply um, in assessing your application. And the qualities and abilities which we're looking for are, are actually set out on our website, available on our website. If you look under the recruitment heading of, of the website and as part of the pupillage application, you can see the document, it's attached there. If you're in any doubt, can't find it, email us and we can, we can send you a copy. But essentially there are four things um, which are, um, we're looking for in what, no particular hierarchy in, in what I um, now say, but the first is, you know, career motivation. So particularly your interest in chambers and our area of practice and your drive uh, to succeed as a barrister. Uh, the second thing is, is intellectual ability, your ability to analyze, to sift the relevant from the irrelevant and to process and manage information. I think it's fair to say, as Ruth has said, a lot of our work involves some quite you know, complex, really interesting, but complex legal principles and um, the ability to, to reason really very, very uh, well is, is, is a key aspect of what we're looking for. And um, probably equally important is the ability to communicate clearly. So being clear, persuasive in your arguments, both written and, and orally. And then the fourth major, um, area of uh, or, or criteria that which we're looking for kind of more broadly personal qualities which we can break down into and we have broken down into some subheadings which you'll see but an important element of that is the sort of balance between being able to work independently and being very self-reliant but also being able to sort of work with other people in a team because you you know you're always going to be instructed by solicitors you always have clients you may be part of a council team you may have to deal with experts you know there is a there is a lot of actually working with others in in what is a self-employed and, and independent um, profession i think what's really important for me to emphasize is that when you know we're looking for potential of of these qualities of these qualities. We, we know when you come to apply for pupillage, you know, you're not the finished article. Um, we're very keen that people from all sorts of backgrounds apply to us. And we understand that you may well have had very little exposure to the sort of work that we do and that Ruth and Eliza have been describing. A lot of what we do, you know, doesn't even come up in, in a, a three-year law degree, let alone, you know, a one-year GDL or, um, uh, you know other other legal studies so when it comes to showing interest in our area that may be demonstrated as Ruth has mentioned by, by doing mini pupillages but but this year you know we quite understand that may well not have been possible for people um, but reading about us on our website um, research projects that you've done as part of your studies which have sparked an interest in in the sort of work we do. Those are all ways of, of showing that you're interested in, um, in our work without, you know, any need really to have a very detailed knowledge or having work, you know, worked in a private client department of a, of, a, of a firm for three months, whatever. We're not, you know, that's not, a, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for potential and, and interest. So uh, coming on to the fourth topic, um, how do we assess your application? What the, what's the sort of process once you've submitted it? Um, there are four stages in assessing pupillage applications. I mean, obviously the first thing we do is to review your application on paper. And we have a particular scoring scheme which we apply, um, which is designed to identify the applications which best fit our, our criteria. Um, we anonymize applications and we remove details of your um, school and university because we think that best ensures that your application is assessed without any irrelevant uh, unconscious bias creeping in. Um, but one thing I wanted to mention is that we do invite you to complete a voluntary questionnaire, which is then used by um, our recruitment partner, Rare Recruitment, who are an independent recruitment specialist, who can help then put your educational results in, in the context of how your school or university year has performed as a as a whole so that 
and particularly <clears throat> if on paper it might look you like you might have underperformed you know that allows us to see well that's a something actually that we should make allowances for because compared to everyone else in your year you performed extremely extremely well um, so that's the first stage of the paper sift the next stage is that we we invite applicants whose paper applications you know, have passed our sift to do a piece of written work uh, in a relatively short time scale I think it's perhaps overnight or in a, in a couple of days and that that piece of written work it doesn't require any prior legal knowledge will give you everything you need um, to do the problem, to, to answer the question. Uh, and, and in fact, we, we prefer if you don't know anything about it in advance, in a way. It's, it's designed to test your ability to analyse and to communicate your conclusions very concisely and precisely. And those answers, again, are marked. And then at that point, successful applicants are invited to a first round interview. Uh, and the first round interview is typically done by two people, probably, as I said, in March. The interview is about 25 minutes long, and it will involve a kind of mixture of questions which are specifically designed to you know, tease out um, whether or not you satisfy our, our criteria, particularly you know, the personal qualities, which may not uh, have been apparent from the, the written stuff that we've seen. Um, so, for example, typically we'll ask you to talk about something you've done in the past, uh, which demonstrates a particular quality we're looking for, and we'll explore with you what you did and how you handled the situation. And then we'll also sort of explore with you your reasoning and communication skills, uh, probably by talking about the, a bit, in a bit more detail about the written problem that you've, you've done and ask, asking you some questions designed to sort of tease that and test test that. So that's the first round interview. And then um, there will be a second round interview. I should say it's important to say there's no quota of, of numbers that go through from the first round to the second round. We'll put through as many as we think have a realistic um, chance of being offered pupillage to the second round. Um, the second round is a, a, an interview with a, a larger panel, perhaps Three, three, I think, is um, what we've been doing in recent years. And it will be a longer interview, perhaps about 40 minutes. But the idea is the same. Um, there'll be targeted questions designed to test um, the criteria that we're looking for. And you'll probably be given a piece of um, a, a problem again, this time to look at and discuss orally rather than doing written work. Um, we might ask you to argue you know, for particular positions and then um, explore that with you in the interview. So I'm conscious when I'm describing the process that, you know, this can, and I'm sure it does sound daunting. The thing to stress is that, you know, from our perspective, we're keen to make sure that you have every opportunity to show your potential um, to us, which is why we've got a very structured and, and kind of multi-layered, um, multi-stage process. Um, but We'd love to see applications from as diverse a range as possible. Frankly, we think that's the best way of getting, you know, the best pool of um, applicants and ultimately barristers before us. So don't have any preconceptions really about the sort of person we're looking for um, when it comes to comes to applying. If you think the work that we do sounds interesting, from what uh, Ruth and Eliza have said, and, and you know, it is, it is very interesting on a lot of different levels. Um, and a very rewarding area, please do think about applying to us this year. And I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Sorry, I'm going to hand over to Arabella now. Um, so as Ruth said, I finished pupillage at the beginning of October, just a few weeks ago. Everything was on plan, went to time despite the pandemic. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about what pupillage was like at Five Stone Buildings. But also, I think the one thing, one thing you really get from a mini pupillage is a feel of what it's actually like to come into work at that particular chambers each day. So I'll try to give you a sense of that as much as possible. If you do have any specific or general questions about pupillage, put them in the q and I'm really happy to answer them. The basic structure of your pupillage at 5SB is that you sit with four supervisors over the year. 
you get three months with each supervisor. I don't think you could say that you have specific seats in each practice area like a law firm might, but I think there is definitely thought behind your pupil supervisor allocation in terms of what you have and haven't seen already. And they'll make sure that you get experience of all of the key practice areas in both contentious and non-contentious work. In terms of what your day looks like, my hours during pupillage were always 9.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. and a proper break for lunch. I very occasionally came in a bit earlier if I was going to court with someone that morning. You might also have a supervisor who say prefers you to come in at nine and leave around 5.30, maybe because they have to be off earlier for childcare or something. So, so it does depend, but I think that the basic number of hours you do is pretty consistent as a pupil. There's absolutely no expectation that you work in the evenings or at weekends. And I know you might hear that and think, okay, that's the official line, but is there an unofficial expectation that you should show you're keen by coming in early and staying late? But genuinely at Five Stone Buildings, there's no silent expectation that you'll do that. And I know that because one week early on in my pupillage, I stayed until about 6.30 p.m. for two days in a row, just because I hadn't quite finished reading a case or something. And someone came in and said, you've really got to stop staying so late as if it were 2 a.m. or something. Um, and I literally got chivied out of the door. So people really do want you to take breaks. I think the hours make a huge difference to what your pupillage experience is like, because you are taking in a lot. Most of it's very new. And when you do work, you work hard. You're using your brain all day. But because the hours are so reasonable, I think things just always seem manageable. I was expecting it to be the most stressful year ever, just because that's sort of what I heard at bar school. But actually, I never felt over, I never felt exhausted or overworked. I had plenty of time to see my friends and do non-law things. And it was actually really nice to have my evenings and weekends back after being a student for so long. As for what you might be doing in the hours when you are working, I found it really depended on what work my supervisor happened to be doing at that time and how far into pupillage I was. I think it's natural to be a bit nervous about the work before you start pupillage and to wonder if you're going to be thrown in at the deep end and asked to do all these, all these things you have no idea how to do. But I realized pretty quickly it just wasn't going to be like that. I was eased into the work really gently. In my first month or two, I mostly went along to court to watch and take notes, either with my supervisor or other people in chambers. I also did quite a lot of legal research, again, either for my supervisor or for other people. Doing both of those things as a very new pupil was actually great because it introduced me to lots of new areas and gave me time to get to grips with them. But it was also a really good opportunity to get to know other people in chambers and to do something useful for them and get off to a good start with them. And when I started doing my first pieces of written work, it didn't feel so daunting because I'd already spent time doing legal research, getting feedback from people on that. And I'd read quite a lot of my supervisor's written work and observed quite a lot by that stage. Also, you aren't just told to do some research or written work and then sent away with no idea how to start. The person setting the work always gave me some suggestions about what books to look in or maybe pulled out a few issues from the papers for me to focus on. And then the volume and the difficulty of my work was really gradually increased as I learned more and more. And by my third supervisor, I was doing quite a lot of written work. Most of it was live work, so real instructions that he had been given rather than work he'd already completed a year ago. He would send me the papers with a few pointers, then we'd both independently do the work write the opinion or whatever it was. Then we'd compare our versions and talk them through. And I learned so much from doing that. So to summarize the things you might be actually doing as a pupil, you could be attending court or mediations or client conferences or meetings with expert witnesses. And you'll be either taking a note or observing those. I also attended conferences that we as a chambers put on all conferences where my supervisor was speaking. 
you could also be doing legal research, maybe quite a big bit of research for someone else in chambers, or maybe just something small that your supervisors asked you to look up. You'll be doing written work, so maybe a skeleton argument, an opinion, a particular claim or a defense, or you might be writing a letter. And if you're listening to this and thinking, I don't know how to do any of that, don't worry, because you learn the basics of all of those things in bar school and then you kind of learn them all over again during pupillage. And then I also did some miscellaneous things as a pupil, mostly with Ruth actually, um, helping with pro bono work. I wrote a summary of a case for the Chambers website. I also co-wrote an article with Ruth for a legal journal. So as you can see, there's actually quite a lot of variety in what you might be doing each day. And you might be doing any one of those things in a completely different practice area. So I found I might be attending an urgent injunction in an art fraud case one week. Then the next week, it might be legal research about capacity to marry for a court of protection case, or maybe drafting pleadings in a proprietary estoppel case. And as everyone else has said, I found that whatever I was doing, it tended to involve a person or a family or some particular objects or heirlooms, as well as some quite complex law. So it just couldn't fail to be interesting to me. It's a really good combination. In other areas of the bar, it's quite common for pupils to get on their feet during their second six months of pupillage and to actually start practicing and taking their own clients. At Five Stone Buildings, you don't tend to get on your feet as a pupil. You carry on learning in chambers with your supervisors. I was really grateful to have the time to carry on learning. And even though I wasn't really practicing, I still got my provisional practicing certificate and the clerks looked out for little bits of work that I might be able to do in my own name. And I actually did do an opinion in my own name towards the summer of my pupillage. And I also did deviling on real cases for other members of chambers. So there might be an opportunity to do some work in your second six. And then beyond work, you might be wondering what the more social side of chambers is like and it's a shame that mini pupillages aren't possible at the moment because i felt like i really saw that when i did a mini pupillage at five stone buildings during my mini and during pupillage i found chambers a really friendly social place to be you aren't just coming in and working in isolation all day well in, in normal non-pandemic times you aren't People were constantly stopping by my supervisor's rooms to catch up or talk through cases with them. I was also really encouraged to go to Chambers Tea every day as a pupil, which is pretty relaxed. I really got to know people I might not have seen that much of otherwise. And it's also amazing how much you learn about being in practice just by listening to people talking at Chambers Tea. I was always made to feel like I was part of Chambers. People would often invite me to come to court with them if they had a particularly fun or interesting case or something that they thought would be useful for me to see. And I was invited to all of the Chambers events, to lunch with people, to drinks after work and so on. Basically, I was expecting it to be quite a stressful year and actually it was far more relaxed than I thought it would be. You are obviously conscious that you're on show and people are deciding if your work is good enough but it just felt like everyone wanted me to do well. It was never about putting me under loads of pressure and seeing if I would crack. Everyone was really generous with their time and their help. And it was all about preparing me for tenancy and my own practice at the bar and just putting me in a position where I could show everyone my best work. Q&A? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I'm conscious that Eliza definitely has to go at six. She's very busy uh, and we're all very lucky that if we're busy at the moment, so we definitely have to let her go then. Um, but I wonder if I could ask her one of the questions first, which is uh, what is the difference between five stone buildings and other chambers that we're usually compared to? What sets us apart, Eliza? Are we all mad? No. <laughs> um, well, I would say we were talking about this the other day. I think we are possibly the most specialist private client um, or traditional chancery chambers. Um, I mean, there are other places that do it, but we um, do it almost exclusively apart from our little pockets of land and art. Um, does everyone agree with that? Yeah. Uh, I think that's one of the main things that sets us apart. I mean, I do think we're very 
friendly, but I've no idea how friendly other chambers are. So uh, they might also be friendly. I think the one year pupillage, which is also linked to what Sarah was saying about how in some ways uh, the area is very, you know, can be very complicated in lots of different ways. Um, for sociable, but again, other places might be too. Um, yeah, and we're mad <laughs> in the best possible way. <laughs> um, thanks very much, Eliza. Um, one of the other questions that we have is uh, about whether it's worth making an application for pupillage in this round um, because uh, the app a potential applicant has only been able to do one mini pupillage because there aren't that many mini pupillages available at the moment. So I was going to mention that I thought there are other ways of getting experience. They might not be as good as mini pupillages, but lots of things aren't as good in COVID as they um, were before. What you can do is you can go to see other webinars like this. There are some that the Chancery Bar Association have put on, some other chambers do it too. You can watch Supreme Court TV uh, and get a feel for the kind of cases that might be involved uh, in this area. We also have webinars which we are put on as marketing tools for our own practices but these could be a great insight into the kind of work that us and other chambers are doing so I'd encourage you to do that. What do you think Sarah? If someone's not able to get many pupillage this year because of the pandemic should they still be applying for pupillage in January? Yeah I mean I don't think that should put you off making an application because I think everybody is going to understand you know the the limits and the difficulties that an applicant this year has faced in assembling mini pupillages and although mini pupillages are an important way of um, experiencing what it's like to be in chambers in a sense they're much more for your benefit than than for ours and, and you know if if as Ruth has said you can um, establish that you are interested in the sort of work we're doing in other ways by as I said when I spoke about reading or uh, watching webinars or you know referring to maybe research projects that you've done as part of your studies um, then 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 I don't think it will in any way detract from your application that you haven't done a mini pupillage this year uh, with with a chance reset with the five stone buildings in particular so I would definitely agree I mean on, in terms of um, in terms of the material that's available also to give you a feel of the sort of work that we do in chambers a little more more of a feel uh, I did a, a talk for um, UCL actually on their laws connection course their first year uh, course and that's available on our YouTube um, channel which gives you a little bit of an introduction into sort of um, claims under the 75 Act and disputes about wills, so that, that might be worth uh, watching as well as our, our, more, our webinars, which are more designed for solicitors to, to watch. I'm going to go, by the way, but... Thanks very much, Eliza. See you later. Bye. Um, one question that we've been asked is what chambers are, do specialise in art law? Well, I had a look on the Chambers and a Partners UK bar site and it, we have by far and away the most barristers that specialise in art law. It's just that it's not the core of everyone's practice. So if you come expecting to do exclusively art law you'll be unfortunately sorely disappointed. I did look at the other places where there are individual practitioners that do art law, there's Joe Smuha QC at Essex Court Chambers, there's Gilead Cooper at Wilberforce Chambers, there are people at Searle Court, there's somebody at a place called the 36 Group which I can't say I'd heard of before and there are some other chambers too but if you're interested in that do check out Chambers and Partners or the Legal 500 to see who they recommend. I thought it was interesting that Chambers and Partners don't actually recommend any particular sets for art law um, but um, that's a good idea to see uh, in the directories what chambers are really um, uh, specialising in and what they uh, other people think that they are actually uh, good at. Um, we've also been asked a couple of questions about non-traditional backgrounds, Sarah. So one of the questions is, what about career changes? Do we welcome people who've had uh, a career uh, before coming to the bar? And yeah. There's also a question uh, saying that we all sound lovely and posh, um, uh, but the applicant comes from a very non-traditional background and she's concerned that it, she, that's not her. She enjoys chancery. Uh, is it somewhere that she would fit in? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, De definitely to both. Um, career changes 
we've actually got a couple of certainly one member of chambers who, who did have a, a previous career and one uh, person who's, who's recently again had a sort of another career change who, who'd come from a, a, a previous sort of career background so um, yes absolutely to that and also um, you know I'm, we may sound lovely and posh but that's not not necessarily what our background um, actually you know is but I think what I, I really do want to stress that we don't have a sort of preconception of uh, what a chancery barrister or, or a member of chambers looks like. We're working really hard to try to sort of eliminate in our recruitment process any any unconscious bias that we might, you know, chambers pe uh, people conducting the recruitment process might possibly have um, when doing that recruitment. So we're, we're actively doing things to try to encourage people to apply from backgrounds that might not otherwise have considered an, a, 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 a chancery pupillage we've um, as I said doing some contextual recruitment as well as anonymization so I really would um, encourage you to to give us a go because I think that's um, that's something that we're very conscious of and we're trying very hard to make sure that you know we 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 widen our appeal if you like to, to people who might not otherwise have looked at us because we want the best you know we want the best people from wherever they come from yes and someone else has said that um they think that the composition of the recent pupils, uh, they're concerned about the backgrounds being quite homogenized, although they don't use quite that word. They say they're non-Oxbridge or non-Russell group. Do they have a fair chance of joining in the application process? And I would say that um, what we're really interested in is academic uh, ability. Now that can be uh, and often is shown through grades, but we anonymize the universities, but it can be shown in other ways. A solicitor uh, who wants to change to the bar was asking me whether there was any point in doing that if he felt that he didn't have the kind of university degree that um, many people at the Chancery Bar have. And I said to him that I thought that there were lots of ways in which he could use his own experience uh, to um, uh, show the uh, academic ability he had, even though that's not in terms of grades. So uh, I would encourage people to apply and you, I do understand that the, um, uh, there are only so many um, slots on the gateway that you can apply to, um, but I would encourage people to apply to the sets that they're interested in the work for, uh, and hopefully that will uh, shine through in the application process. Uh, I also wanted to mention to the uh, student who asked the question about coming from uh, a non-traditional background that she, I think it was a she, she might be assisted by looking at the recording of the race and ethnicity uh, webinar that the Chantry Bar Association recently put it on and I helped organise because that, can, that talked a little bit about uh, ways in which people coming from different backgrounds um, have made successful careers at the Chantry Bar. Um, um, we've got a question about the BPTC, Sarah. Someone said they got a competent. Will that affect their application? Well, I think it's always important if um, you feel there's something about your educational achievements that perhaps doesn't reflect your true potential to explain in your application form why, why that is, if there are particular reasons which affected your um, performance in that exam and we give you a, an opportunity to do that in your your application so if you feel that's not a fair reflection of your um, performance then um, then then do do explain but what I would say is that performance on the BPTC is only one element of your overall academic um, performance and so for example if you've got a really good degree or, or other um, demonstration of your intellectual um, potential and ability, then we would, uh, you know, that the, the BP, BPTC result would only be one probably quite small element in the balance. Thanks very much, Sarah. I've got a question which is, what is the typical career objective considered after 12 months of pupillage? I wondered if Arabella had an idea what her career objective was for one year's time. So for one year's time? Yeah. 
I think just building on what I already learned over pupillage, getting comfortable with running my own cases and uh, all the practical things that come with actually practicing at the bar rather than just doing everything in theory. Um, and yeah, maybe appearing live in court rather than over a screen would be good. We'll see. You might want to have developed some relationships with solicitors and tried to do different things, maybe even got to do one type of case twice, Arabella, if you're really lucky, so you're not having to do things always for the first time. Yeah, that would be good. And, and actually feeling, feeling for the first time, actually, you know, I've done this before. I, I have some idea of how it might go. I'm looking forward to that. Sure. Thanks very much, Arabella. Um, Sarah, in terms of application timeline, yes. what stage of study is it best to apply? Yes. Is this January, February window intended for pupils this year? And can applications be made years in advance if you're still yes. studying? Yeah, no, let me let me clarify the, um, the, 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 the time scale. So an application which you make uh, in 2021 is for pupillage, let me get this right, commencing October 2022. Um, I think that's right. Uh, so, so you are applying quite a long way in advance. Is that right, Arabella? I got that wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Slightly quizzical. Um, yeah, so, uh, so you do apply, you know, basically 18 months in advance of, um, of, of starting pupillage. Um, so, I mean, the earliest, I suppose, that you could apply is in your final year of your degree, if you are doing a law degree. That's right. Uh, otherwise, but, but not everyone will apply at that stage. Somebody might want to do a master's. They might want to take some time out to work out, you know, what they're doing. And I don't think that, you know, I'm not, not going to be prescriptive about when in your life you apply for, for pupillage by any means, but the, um, you know, that's, that's the application timetable or timeline. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, there's a question about gender and uh, race diversity from Falak. Thanks very much for that. The, one of the questions is about what the male and female ratio is. So uh, Five Stone Buildings, uh, we're very lucky that half of our silks are female. There are uh, a few more men than women uh, in the ranks of the junior members in chambers. But as you can see, there's plenty of women at Five Stone Buildings uh, and uh, Eliza did joke with me that we might um, be giving the indication that there were only women at Five Stone Buildings, but that isn't the case. Um, you can find out about the difference in ratios of, of gender at Legal Cheek that has all the ratios of silks and juniors up on their website. Um, in general, uh, I think we're one of uh, the few chambers at the bar that has as many as half uh, of female silks but I don't think if you're starting out in 2020 that there's um, any reason to think that as a woman you can't succeed at the bar. Our head of chambers uh, is uh, female and um, um, I've been really lucky to be at Five Stone Buildings and have such great female role models. In terms of ethnic diversity, I think we have one or maybe two people in chambers who would consider themselves to be um, part of uh, an ethnic minority. Um, there probably are some statistics that are gathered, but I don't know uh, whether what those uh, necessarily are for chambers as a whole. Uh, but I would say that Again, in 2020, I would not expect anybody from uh, a non-white background to suffer uh, discrimination at the Chancery Bar, at Five Stone Buildings, or really anywhere at the bar. It's completely unacceptable if people do face that those kind of barriers. And uh, I think particularly, at, certainly um, what I think of the Chancery Bar, it's not where you come from, it's really where you're going that counts. Um, so we would encourage um, applications from people with all backgrounds. Um, you, uh, oh yes, there's somebody, Sarah, that's asked a question about their BSB exams. Uh, the, the BSB have postponed their uh, exams and they can't sit them until September. They don't think that they will have the results in time for the application. Will that have a negative impact? No, I mean, again, we understand, you know, the difficulties that anybody who's doing studies in this, in this environment is under. Um, 
so it's not going to have a negative impact. Um, in fact, if you do the exams in December, you'll probably have the results if you're going to be invited to, to an interview anyway, and you can communicate them when they come when they come in, but it's not, um, it's not going to put you at a disadvantage. Um, and uh, I, there was a question which I think we uh, wrapped up mostly in uh, the talks that uh, individual people did. Um, there's a question about skills uh, for members of uh, chambers, and I think that Sarah talked about that in terms of pupillage, um, in terms of making a successful career um, uh, at the bar, obviously public speaking and confidence is important, academic ability and analytical ability and reasoning is important, people skills are really important, and good strong written work is important. Um, and I think Arabella also covered uh, what the best features of pupillage and training were at Five Stone Buildings. And I would say that um, the exposure to really good quality advocacy and written work is excellent and the support uh, and work-life balance are also excellent. Um, uh, so there's a question from Gary, Sarah, which is that a student can apply 18 months before they intend to start pupillage. Uh, the question is, what about earlier, so 24 or 36 months time? We don't normally accept applications that far in advance. That's right, isn't it? No, uh, that's right. And in a sense, because we're part of pupillage gateway, the timetable for applications is really prescribed for us by gateway. So we can only, you know, we're making applications in accordance with their timetable, which is 18 months basically in, in advance. So there isn't really any flexibility about about that and in fact I think it's now the position that all chambers whether they're in gateway or not have to adhere to that um, timetable so. So Falak says she's finishing her law degree in summer 2020 when would she apply for pupillage that would be January 2021 wouldn't it Sarah 18 months um, ago. That's right unless she's intending or he or she's intending not to to um to start straight away, if you see what I mean, straight out. If she's not intending to go to BPTC next year, but rather do a master's, let's say, you know, she might be looking at the following year. But yes, if if BPTC is a next year's plan, then yes, you'd be applying for people this round. Super. I think we've managed to get through all the questions. So thanks everybody who stayed for all the answers and thanks ever so much to Arabella, Sarah and Eliza who sadly had to go uh, to finish her work and Jo uh, who is our um, ad, um, administrative staff for setting up the webinar. Thanks ever so much everybody. Um, you'll be able to watch it again on the vid video stream on the website if you want to in the future. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye bye. Bye.